The first four years of that were in California. The last six have been right here in White Center and Deerfield. So this is what I've been doing. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to take away something out of this. Uh, I'm going to be talking today specifically about the gangs that are found in uh, Burien, uh, White Center, uh, West Seattle, and uh, in some cases down into SeaTac. Gangs don't recognize boundary lines, so pretty much anything that's in West Seattle is going to be in SeaTac and vice versa. So when I say North High Line or whatever, it all means that general encompassing area. So again, it's not <coughs> what the traditional North High Line boundaries are. So, can everyone see the board? Is it dark enough that yeah. I have a problem? Okay, outstanding. And everyone can hear me? Okay, good deal. So I'm gonna talk real quick about some Gangs 101, some basic gang stuff. I'm gonna talk about the gangs that are in the North Highline area. And then I'm gonna talk a bit about recognizing gang activity and then recognizing gang graffiti. And I'm gonna talk about uh, how to tell the difference between actual criminal street gang graffiti. And graffiti is just in my taggers or kids that fancy themselves as artists. So to begin with, the gang unit that I'm a part of is actually the third incarnation of the Kerry County Sheriff's Office gang unit. Our two previous gang units were eliminated because of budget cuts. Back in the 90s and back in the early 2000s, apparently we solved the gang problem twice. So we eliminated our gang units. So I'm hoping we don't solve it a third time because I like my job. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so this is the third gang unit. This third gang unit started after one of our deputies, Steve Cox, was killed up in White Center by a Union Street Black Gangster Disciple gang member goes by the nickname Satan. Uh, Burian, after that happened, Burian decided, hey, we need to attack our gang problems, so they reallocated two deputies and made them a special emphasis team. Shortly thereafter, we got approval from the county council to start an actual sheriff's office gang unit again. <clears throat> so I've been doing that uh, since uh, early 2007. Uh, so today, our gang unit, we have a gang sergeant, we have five gang detectives that work nothing but Burian, White Center, Skyway, and uh, SeaTac area. Uh, we do go throughout the county, but West Precinct, Precinct 4, North High Line is our primary area of operations. We also have the two storefront deputies that are attached to our uh, unit nominally, uh, BJ and Marty Hodge up in Skyway. We have a DOC officer, Department of Corrections, who makes it really useful for dealing with those uh, uh, gang members that are on probation through the state. We have a detective that's specifically assigned to that DOC officer because he makes quite a mess. So we need to have someone to clean up just his stuff. And then we also have six reserve deputies. Uh, these are uh, King County Sheriff's Office deputies that are normally assigned to patrol in Burien White Center, uh, Shoreline, or unincorporated North Bend, you know, areas anywhere in the county. They've actually been fully trained up in uh, uh, gang awareness, so they know how to document, what to do, what to see, what to say. Uh, and they have the uniform, so if we need a force multiplier, we can say, hey, coming out on overtime, and we got six more guys with gang uniforms, so we can out. Uh, uh, go out and make a presence, much like this, some of our gangsters. So just some real quick stats before we start. We have 143 active criminal street gangs in King County as of 2010. It seems like a lot. Of those 143, 87 are active in South King County, but of those 87, only 46 have more than 15 <coughs> members. So it seems like a lot, but you got to remember the state's definition of a criminal street gang is three or more people. So we got some street gangs that are five people, seven people large. And are they really a, a big uh, effect in the community? Not really. It's the street gangs that are 450 to 500 people strong, and we're really worried about it. But in South King County, we have 46 uh, gangs that are considered medium to large, and then a few that are large size. South King County estimates that there's only, uh, we estimate only 4,000 gang members in South King County. <laughs> Uh, we estimate a total of 12,000 for all of King County, including the city of Seattle. And when you look at the population of King County, that's actually a, a really small number. When you want to compare it to Chicago, you want to compare it to Los Angeles County, and in Los Angeles County you're seeing 200 to 300,000 gang members. We're actually looking pretty good. We're at a point where we're still able to work on this and, and control some of the effect in the communities. And I'll actually talk a little bit, uh, very briefly, because it's still an ongoing investigation, but I'll, I'll uh, give you one case where we actually have made a pretty good hit. Uh, so when we think of street gangs, this is what we think of. Little Valley Lacote Sereños, Northside Villa Norteños. We think of people that click too fast. We think of tiny rascal gangsters or 7-4 Hoover criminals. We think of groups of individuals throwing up hand signs, dressing in common colors, usually of a single race. We think of them usually being male. But I'm going to tell you right now, perception and reality are not at all the same. 
gangs are not at all what you think of when you look at those pictures or when you look at the movie Colors or when you think of what you've seen on TV. Gangs don't discriminate at all based on age. Gang members are brought into the gang lifestyle as young as birth in some cases. We have multiple examples of multi-generational criminal street gangs in King County where they're working on their third and fourth generations of gang members, meaning that their fathers or their uncles were gang members, their grandfathers were um, or gang members. In some cases, they can trace their gang membership back to the late 60s, all in the same gang or in allied gangs. These are children that are born into a gang lifestyle and know absolutely nothing different. It is very hard to divert those children away from the gang lifestyle when they know nothing else. Ones that aren't born into the gang lifestyle, the gangs understand that you get more work out of a juvenile than you do out of an adult. Meaning if I put a gun in a 13 year old's hands, he's not going to get very much time. If I put it in a 17 year old's hands, he's looking at a lot of time on the state side because he's going to big boy jail. That juvenile is going to juvenile hall. The chances are he's going to see some kind of deferred sentence probation with a minimal amount of time served and be back on the street acting as a gang member after earning his stripes and becoming a full member of the gang. Gangs know that they can get more work out of juveniles, and they are fully using our juvenile justice system for their ends. They're recruiting as young as age seven in Bury. Gangs don't discriminate at all based on race. You think of the Crips of the Bloods as being black street gangs. You think of Serenos and Ortenos as being uh, Hispanic street gangs or Mexican street gangs. Absolutely not true. The second oldest criminal street gang in King County, or Hispanic street gang in King County, is the Barrio Locos. This is the current street level leader of the Barrio Locos. He's as white as me. All white members, a white 7-4 Hoover Crip, a Russian Sereno. We have all white criminal street gangs. Race does not matter at all. Doesn't play one factor at all except for white supremacists, for obvious reasons. <laughs> Gender doesn't matter at all either. Once upon a time, females used to be hanging out with gangsters because their boyfriends were gang members, or because they were uh, looking to meet a boy or something like that. We have all female criminal street gangs in King County. We have five that are validated as such. Sereñas Malditas Locas, right here in the middle, is. Uh, one of our more active ones. Our females look the same, act the same, dress the same, tag the same, commit all the same criminal activities. In some cases, they have their own specific sets of criminal activities that the males can't do. For example, <laughs> female gang members can pose as prostitutes, bring their tricks to somewhere where the rest of the gang can then jump them and rob them. Male, pro male uh, gang members can't pose as prostitutes. Some of our female gangs, we have quite a few, exactly the same activity as males. They even target their rival male counterparts. So some basic gang terminology that I'm going to talk about, that I'm going to use in the presentation today when I say gang. Um, it's what I'm talking about when I say like the overriding group. So like Crips and Bloods. Everyone's probably familiar with Crips and Bloods. So when I say gang, I'm thinking Crips and Bloods. If I say uh, set or subset or clique or hood or tray, that is considered like a subgroup of that group gang. So like the Barrio Locos I mentioned earlier, are a clique of the Sereno criminal street gang, or a subgroup. Uh, they fall under the Sereno umbrella. A uh, prison gang is any gang formed inside prison walls. I probably won't mention that in this presentation. Uh, nor will I mention defunct or dormant gangs because they don't really matter to you guys. Uh, they're not around, so I won't mention them. Kind of a little trouble with my clicker here. I think BJ's blocking <laughs> Real quick note about uh, the gang culture. Most gang cultures, uh, almost across the entire gang subculture, are based upon the ideas of respect and reputation. Their entire world revolves around it. That's absolutely true with the older gangs. It's becoming less and less true with the newer and younger gangs. The ideas of respect and reputation aren't quite what they used to be. Uh, even the leaders of the gangs are finding that they don't have as much control over the gangs as they used to, or as their generation's leaders did. When I'm talking about respect in the gang culture, I'm not talking about the kind of respect that you and I think of. In the gang culture, respect is fear. The more you fear me, the more you respect me. They create that respect, or they create that fear, by doing criminal acts, by standing on the street corner and looking and acting like thugs, by committing criminal acts in their neighborhood and uh, intimidating the community, or by 
uh, putting up graffiti on the walls and just letting you know that gangs are here. And when they create that fear in the community, when they create that respect, what that allows them to do is it allows them to recruit the next generation of gang members because those young kids growing up looking up to the gang because the gang gets the money, gets the girls, gets the cars, gets the respect. That young generation is going to go to a gang that gets respect. So they're not going to go to gangs that don't have any respect, that uh, aren't considered a presence in the neighborhood because why would you want to join a bunch of weak gang members? You want to join the strongest gang, the biggest gang. So it allows them to recruit their younger members. Uh, that respect, that fear that they create allows them to control their neighborhood. When they know that they can commit crimes with impunity because the citizens are too afraid to talk to the police, they win. And this is what happens when we go to a stabbing and 37 people were in the bathroom at the same time. Two person bathroom, but 37 people say I was in the bathroom, didn't see what happened. Or we show up in an apartment complex and people say, I didn't see, I didn't see shit, and they walk away. Uh, by the way, I may occasionally swear. <laughs> <laughs> Apologize to the defense. When I get to the graffiti, I very certainly will swear because I'm going to be reading off the graffiti. Uh, they're going to say, I didn't see anything. Um, or they're going to say, I called 911, but I didn't see anything. Well, why'd you call 911? I'm talking to you. And this, this is the battle that we have to overcome. And the, and the reason is because the community knows that when we leave, the gang members don't. We can only be there at certain times of the day, but the gang members are 24 hours a day. And they see who the community is talking to. They see that they're talking to the police. So when they do that, they get to control that. They know that they can commit their crimes and walk away without a problem. There's a number of different ways you can join a gang. Uh, a couple of the most common ones, you get jumped in, or basically you're going to take a beating for the gang, you're going to prove the gang, you're going to take a beating and you're willing to fight for them. Usually starts off with your prospective gang member standing in a circle there. There we go. Standing uh, in the center uh, with gang members around him in a circle. Uh, somebody's got a stopwatch for different gangs, it's a different amount of time. Uh, in this case, it's Little Valley de Cotes, so it's a Sereno gang, they do a jump in for 13 seconds because they associate with the number 13. So you get your stopwatch man who's sitting off on the back and he says, go! And after th and, uh, the rest of the gang members start jumping your prospective gang member. Usually that prospective gang member tries to fight back, but after a couple seconds he's on the ground in a fetal position protecting his ribs and his face. After 13 seconds they say stop, the other gang members back up off of him, and uh, as long as he didn't uh, cry out like a girl or try to run away or do something that would cause some uh, major disrespect on the act of the gang members, they're going to bring him into the gang. Uh, he's uh, shown that he's willing to take a beating, he's shown that he's willing to fight against odds greater than just himself, four on one, five on one, six on one, uh, and that's considered one of the things that you have to do to prove your membership in a street gang. One of the other things, most common things, is you crime in, you put in work. You're going to commit a criminal act that benefits the street gang. And what that act is entirely depends on the street gang. It could be something as simple as when a gang's trying to get their name out there, go out and tag our name on 50 walls. I want the street corners to be bombed. I want to see our gang's name everywhere. Simply putting their name out in the neighborhood. Could be something for uh, some of the Asian gangs like in the Rainier Valley that are heading into auto theft. Could be steal me five cars, just make a model, bring them to this location by Friday night. Uh, it could be commit two violent acts against a rival criminal street gang member. Uh, it depends on uh, the individual gang, what their certain criminal act is, where they'll put in work to earn membership in the gang, to earn their stripes. I got five stitches in my head in California from a gang member who earned the stripes on me. Lots of different ways to do it. You can get sponsored in or vouched in. This is where you've got that older uncle or that uh, older brother or cousin or father who's already in the gang, and they're basically going to vouch for you. They're going to bring you into the gang under their wing. They're going to teach you everything there is to know about being a gangster. Uh, and they're going to take responsibility for you. So uh, if that older G has enough uh, respect in the gang, uh, they'll allow you to come in based on his word alone. Of course, a lot of times that older G is going to look down at the gangster and go, I got jumped in, now you're getting your ass jumped in too. Mm -hmm. You can get walked in. This is where you've grown up in the neighborhood, or you've grown up in a gang family your entire life. Uh, you don't have to prove yourself. The gang already knows that you're not going to snitch, that you're going to take care of business, that you're going to put it down for the hood. Uh, they know that you're going to take care of everything you need to take care of. And so they're just going to let you in the gang. All you have to do is ask. You get courted in. Not as common out here. Uh, basically, you have some kind of good or a service that's going to benefit the gang. A car they can use in a drive-by. A family business they can use for money laundering. Uh, and they'll bring you in as long as they're allowed to use that. 
Uh, females sometimes opt to be sexed in, variants of rolling one or two dice, the number that comes up, that's how many sexual partners within the gang they get to have that night. Uh, and that way they don't have to stab someone or get beat up. And you can get blessed in, very popular in the Midwest gang culture, Chicago gang culture. Uh, and this is actually the kind of the scary one, because you don't have to jump anyone, you don't have to stab anyone or shoot anyone, you don't have to get jumped yourself. What this is, is you have to learn everything there is to know about the gang. It's culture, it's codes, it's signs, it's symbols, it's communications, it's allies, it's enemies, it's territories, it's history, who the leaders are, who their enemies are, all the hand signs, all of your enemies' hand signs so you can recognize them at a moment's notice. Who your enemies are, actually physically who each enemy is, not just the gang, but who the members of the gang are. And when you've learned that knowledge, when you've learned your book of knowledge, you go before a battery of questions of the elders of the gang. And it's like an oral board that we take to become a police officer or to get uh, detective positions or special positions in our job where there's three or four people and we have to answer all these questions. They do the same thing. And they're submitted to an oral battery of questions. If they can answer those questions satisfactorily, they're blessed into the game. It promotes the ability to learn book knowledge. One of the reasons why Midwest gangs are moving towards more of an organized crime model as opposed to a street gang model. <clears throat> So in Washington State, we have two distinct gang subcultures. We have Los Angeles based, which is Sereno versus Norteño, or Blood versus Crip, roughly predicated along the lines of the colors red and blue. Uh, for the Hispanics, there's also a number, variants for both. And then we have Chicago based gang culture, which is the Folk Nation versus the People's Nation. They evolved along an uh, entirely separate line of uh, evolution, it has completely separate numbers, identifiers, and codes. Uh, for North Highline here specifically, we have no Norteño gangs, we have no People's Nation gangs. So mostly what we're dealing with is Sereño, we're dealing with Crip and Blood, and we're dealing with a very small smattering of Folk Nation gangsters. We also don't have any hybrids, so I'm not going to worry about that. So I'm going to start with Los Angeles-based gang culture, specifically, specifically Sereño gangs. Sereño gangs are predominantly Hispanic, uh, and again, Predominantly meaning, yes, that is the majority of their membership, but we have white Sereños, we have black Sereños, we have Asian Sereños. All races are involved. It doesn't matter. Sereño is Spanish for Southerner, Sur is Spanish for South, and so because of that, Sereño gang members are going to associate with anything related to Southern California, which is where their birthplace is, specifically the city of Los Angeles. So Los Angeles Dodgers team here, or San Diego Chargers team here or Los Angeles brand clothing line, or Southside, or Dirty South, or South Pole brand clothing lines. Anything that relates to the South is something that Sereno gang members will find themselves wearing. Uh, that was a 90s thing, it doesn't really happen anymore. Uh, Sereno gang members associate with the number 13, written in a mixture of Roman and Arabic numerals. That 13 represents the 13th letter of the alphabet, which is the letter M. The letter M represents the Mexican Mafia, which is the prison gang, to which Sereno gang members in California pay taxes, and in return receive protection when they go into the California prison systems. Uh, in California, Sereno gangs and Sereno gang members are considered foot soldiers for the Mexican Mafia. And they do the Mafia's bidding on the street while the Mafia is in the prison systems. In California, uh, that's an absolute. In Washington State, it's not quite an absolute. Uh, it depends on the street gang. It depends on the level of sophistication. Uh, but we do have a Mexican Mafia presence in King County. So it, it is out here. It's just not as prevalent as in California. Uh, that 13 can be written in the Arabic 13, as you see there. It can be written in the mixture of the Roman Arabics, the X3, or the standard Roman 13. You'll see the XIII. You'll also see it written uh, in the Spanish word trece, T-R-E-C-E, which is Spanish for 13, or the shorthand form up here, uh, 3-C-E, in the tattoo underneath Sereno right there. Or you'll see uh, it written in this Mayan Numerology. In Mayan numerology, each bar represents a five, each dot represents a one, that's a Mayan 13. A lot of our Sereno gang members like to harken back to their Mayan and Aztec roots because it's their roots as a warrior culture. And so they go back and you'll, you'll see some Mayan and Aztec imagery in tattoos and drawings, etc. So if you see those two bars, three dots, that's a Mayan 13. All Sereno gangs associate with the color blue. Uh, there's one exception for that, uh, Watts Barrio Grape Street. Uh, they actually have a small presence up in Columbia City area of Seattle. Um, and they associate with purple because there's a purple. <coughs> there we go. Talk about that. Uh, and 
and Serena is running as an all-north Tanyos. Now, in King County, our Hispanic gang population is 99% Serena. Uh, the last 1% is split between Brown Priders <coughs> and is split between Nortenos. So half percent Brown Pride, half percent United Latinos, basically. Uh, because we have such a small population of Nortenos, our Serenio gangs fight each other. So we have a lot of blue on blue, which is actually exactly the way it works in Los Angeles. There are no Norteño gangs in Los Angeles. It's all Serenio gangs fighting Serenio gangs, or Serenio gangs fighting Bloods or Crips. So our Serenios fight Serenios for the most part. The uh, main gangs, the main Serenio gangs that we'll find here in uh, White Center, Burien area, the Barrio Locos, uh, and this is, this is what I'm talking about with uh, uh, affecting Barrio Locos is the second oldest gang in King County. They've been around since 1985 or 1986, depending on which gang member you talk to. Uh, from the very beginning, they claimed White Center as their territory. In fact, they took their name from an old community nickname for White Center, El Barrio Loco. So they called themselves the Neighborhood Crazies. We are the people that makes the neighborhood crazy. They claimed this territory, White Center, as their own. Their birthplace is 17th and Delridge. They've been in White Center, and they've been effectively controlling White Center off and on for that 25 years. Uh, they've become quite a big problem. In uh, early May 2010, we made ourselves their problem. And our gang unit uh, basically started focusing on Barrio Locos. Barrio Locos claimed this territory for 25 years. This last year, they've lived here but they've gone and done their dirt down in Des Moines, they've done it down in Kent, and they've done it elsewhere. Because we've made White Center and Burien way too hot for them to operate. We haven't had a Barrio Locos related crime other than graffiti in White Center or Burien for probably at least six months. So we've actually pushed them out of their territory. So it's, it's working. It's hard, but it's working. Uh, we have the Vatos Locos, which share the same initials. Uh, Vatos Locos uh, actually split off of Barrio Locos. I'm assuming that some of those guys already had BL tattoos, so they just came up with a name <laughs> to allow them to keep their tattoos. Uh, but they've been around since 99. They're mostly found now in South Park by a treaty between Barrio Locos and Vatos Locos. They're not supposed to be in Burien and White Center. Uh, they break that all the time in Burien, but for the most part, they stay out of White Center area. Uh, El Monte Flores, which is uh, really only found at the heights of Burien apartment complex in Burien. Um, they don't even live there anymore. They just go back there and gangbang. There's not a whole lot of them. Uh, Southside Locos, which is the oldest Hispanic street gang in King County, they formed up in 1981. Uh, they're just found countywide now, so we really uh, uh, can't pin them down in any one particular place. They're all over the place. Uh, Gangster Serenio Clico, which is in South Park. Cajones Escondidos, which is in South Park. Obviously, any gang that's in South Park, we see up here all the time. So, <laughs> Typical Serenio gang clothing you'll see. Hopefully you won't recognize any of you guys walking around the neighborhood. <laughs> but you'll see the, uh, the LA logo, the LA Dodgers logo. The belts hanging below the <coughs> blue canvas web belts hanging below the shirts there. Typically just you can see shades of blue. Bandanas hanging out of the pockets. You won't see him, he's in prison. <laughs> you think he's a Rams fan? <laughs> Only reason he's wearing it is that 13. Same thing with the LA Dodgers. He's not a Dodgers fan either, but he's showing that uh, Sereno affiliation. Oh, he doesn't even know who Kurt Warner is. How old is he? Not 13. <laughs> 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 uh, just more color coded blue. I mean, that's pretty much what you're going to see. One of the things we're seeing out of California is because all the, they're all Sereno gangs down there. And because there's gang enhancements and gang injunctions in Los Angeles, you're not seeing them wearing colors. You're not seeing them wearing blue bandanas or wearing the all blue and stuff like that. You're seeing a lot of black and whites. What we're seeing here. Uh, obviously the 13 in Los Angeles, but it's black and white instead of being typically serene or gang colors, they're more neutral colors. See the canvas web belts, very popular throughout the gang culture, usually in the color of the gang, in this case brown for brown pride locos or blue for the various Serenio gangs. Uh, they usually put a uh, buckle on it. It's a silver buckle with a single initial or a number. In this case, there's actually three buckles on one belt, spelling out the name of their gang, Brown Pride Locos, or a 13, or a B, which uh, 
that guy said, I got a B because uh, my dad said he knew what a 13 was and he wouldn't let me have the 13. But he got the B because it looks just like a smaller 13. <laughs> Same thing with a bandana. It's usually folded and pressed in a three or a four inch strip. The bandana is considered a symbol of pride. It's their flag. They carry it with respect. You ask them to blow their nose in it, they never will. They, no, it's just a snot rag. It's not my gang rag. And then the, they won't blow their nose in it. So it's a symbol of respect. You know, they carry it folded up nice. <laughs> We don't have any Norteño gangs, so I'm not even going to talk about it. Crip gangs. Again, all races are involved in King County Crip gangs. Typically, when you think of Crips, you think of Crips claiming the color blue. We actually do have a couple of Crip sets that claim colors other than blue. Uh, again, uh, when I say click, for the most part, Hispanic gangs refer to their subgroups as cliques, so I will say Sereno cliques. When I say uh, sets, most Asian and black gangs refer to their subgroups as sets. So I'm just going to say sets for them. So Crip set, same thing as a Crip click, Crip subgroup. Uh, we have uh, Grape Street Crips, which claim the color purple. We have Hoovers, not truly Crips, but they get lumped in that way anyway. Uh, Hoovers, which claim the color orange, or orange and blue in combination. And we have the Marvin Gangster Crip, which claim the color yellow. One of the things that's another Crip identifier is they won't stack uh, a C and a K together when they're spelling out words. Because uh, that CK represents crypto. So they won't spell out words properly that have a C and K together. So they'll spell it out with a CC. So block, B L O C C, is how they'll spell block. If you see two C's stacked together, that's usually a crypt identifier because uh, they won't put that crypt killer in there. Now that's something that's kind of transferred itself from gang culture into kind of a hip hop subculture. And you may see non gang affiliated individuals writing out stuff that way because they think it looks cool, they don't really know what it means. Uh, but it's one of those things that we take in combination with other factors to determine gang membership, but don't do it by itself. But it's certainly something you see with Crip gangs. The main Crip sets that we have here in North High Line, the Hoover Criminals, specifically the West Side 7-4s that are up in West Seattle, and the Highway Hoovers that run the highway, uh, Pacific Highway South, International Boulevard, between Tequila, all the way down to Federal Way and the County Line. Uh, Hoovers claim the color orange and blue. The combination they'll associate with the uh, Houston Astros team gear and that five point star, which they call a Hoover star. And then we'll also see Marvin Gangster Crips, mostly down in the south end of Burien and SeaTac. Uh, again, they associate with the color yellow. Uh, Michigan team gear. Uh, both these gangs are from Los Angeles, so there's um, obviously some LA gang members as well as local gang members that are up here. <coughs> so the local, uh, or some Crip clan clothing we'll see. This guy will have a place in every presentation I do until the end of the time. End of time, because I love the Lake Warmers. <laughs> Lake Warmers just scream gangster in me. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> but typical grip, uh, Crip clothing you're going to see. Crip gang. I can never say that fast right in a row. Crip gang. Crip gang. Uh, Crip gang clothing you'll see. Crips, just general shades of blue. Hoovers, you'll see orange or orange and blue in combination. It's supposed to be just orange. They're not supposed to claim blue anymore, but. Uh, our Hoovers haven't gotten the memo from L.A. on that yet. <laughs> and again, Marvin's, you'll see yellow or yellow and blue. Um, I'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, blood gangs, again, all races involved, but we have... Uh, uh, I don't even know where I was going with that. Uh, all races are involved in King County blood gangs, predominantly here in... Uh, our final line, we have our blood gangs are actually Asian blood gangs. They're not really uh, any other uh, ethnicity or race. They're mostly Southeast Asian, so Cambodian, uh, Laotian, uh, Vietnamese. Um, blood gangs primarily can claim the color red. There is one blood gang in King County that claims something other than red. That's Limehood Piru. Uh, they bang green, but they're mostly up in North Seattle. We don't have them uh, down here in the uh, High Line area, or even South King County for that matter. Uh, if you hear the terms Pyru or Brim, Damu or Swan, those are all synonymous with blood. It means the same thing. Damu is actually Swahili for blood. It actually means blood. But uh, Pyru, Brim, Swan, those are some of the original neighborhoods that formed uh, the Bloods in 1973 back in Los Angeles. So uh, you'll hear someone say, I'm, I'm Pyru, I'm not blood. It's all the same thing. You're blood. Uh, in some places, Pyrus are supposed to claim a burgundy color or a different color of red. We don't really see that here uh, in King County. Pyrus are red. Doesn't matter. And they'll do the same thing. They'll avoid putting uh, the um, C's in their writing. Sometimes it's kind of an old school thing, but we still see it. 
because uh, they don't want to uh, show that respect to the Crips, or they'll cross out C's in the writings. But they will spell out CK because it represents Crip color, so they do like that. Some of the local blood sets we've got. Most of the uh, non-Asian blood sets are actually found up in West Seattle, and they come down here a little bit rarely, but we see them. Uh, West Side Street Mob, which you may remember from the news, 2009-2010, they were very active in promoting prostitution and commercial sex abuse of minors. Uh, very active running them up and down uh, International Boulevard and Aurora up in Shoreline. And uh, we actually put most of the mid-level away on state charges related to prostitution and the upper level away on federal charges related to bank fraud and wire fraud. So Street Mob actually has a very, very reduced presence in West Seattle and White Center now. Uh, 44 Point Side Gangsters, which are uh, out of the High Point neighborhood up in West Seattle. They've been up there for 20 plus years, uh, and they're actually kind of um, underground uh, right now. They're not too active. Um, started off as the Point Side Gangster Crips, and then the Point Side Gangster Bloods, and they've kind of moved around quite a bit since then. But that's pretty much And we have uh, West Side Mafia Blood Gang, which is mostly found in uh, Seattle. I'm sorry, in SeaTac. Um, 34th and 168th is like their home turf and they radiate out from there. But we actually have uh, West Side Mafia blood gang numbers that are found in West Seattle, that are found in uh, Burien and uh, White Center. Uh, so they're kind of all over the place. Typical blood gang clothing, you're going to see shades of red. Same type of stuff. There's no real specific like uh, brand or manufacturer or sports team. Uh, you think this guy's a Boston fan? He stands for blood. So going on to Folk Nation and Chicago gang culture. Again, completely separate gang culture. So completely separate evolution. The Folk Nation associates with number six, the six-pointed star, or the six-pointed star of David, taken in remembrance for one of their leaders, David Barksdale, who was shot in 73 and died in 74. So the six-pointed star of David and pitchforks, and obviously my little picture of pitchforks turned out real small. Uh, pitchforks, usually thrown with a hand to represent like this, or let's make sure this is a dry erase marker before I make that mistake again. Pitchforks drawn like that. Or the folk nation associating with the five-point, the five-pointed star, and uh, kings, like walking kings, symbol of strength. Uh, you don't have to worry about all that stuff underneath it. That's, I don't even make my deputies know that. Uh, folk Nation sets. The, really, the only Folk Nation set that we have in this area that has any kind of presence whatsoever uh, is West Side Gangster Disciple Nation. And their presence is kind of cyclical. They, they go up and down as members uh, go to prison, get back out, or move away. Uh, right now, we're on the low ebb of uh, West Side GDN. Uh, but they were active a few years ago. Um, pretty active. Uh, they're... Uh, pretty evenly split between uh, Hispanic and black membership for uh, West Side GDN. But they'll associate with the number 74 because it represents GD, seventh letter of the alphabet, and the fourth letter of the alphabet. Uh, the same six point of star, they'll associate with the color black and black bandanas, and obviously pitchforks and such. Look, <coughs> you've got seven on your bag. You're a rank higher. I mean, exactly. you I don't have to worry about five or six point stars. So. The point I was going to make at the beginning, and I guess I should have made this at the beginning, unlike uh, Hispanic gangs or Sereno gangs, uh, when I'm talking about Dirty South and South Pole and Los Angeles uh, team gear and, and clothes that specifically can identify somebody as a Sereno gang member, with uh, Crip gangs, Blood gangs, Folk gang, People gangs, it's next to impossible to identify these gang members based on just clothing alone because their clothing very closely conforms with the current hip-hop culture and youth culture styles of clothing. So they're going to wear the same things that non-gang affiliated youth wear. The only difference is you're going to see a predominance of certain colors, or you're going to see bandanas, or those obvious gang-related paraphernalia items, or customized clothing, which I'll talk about in a second. But we don't really uh, identify specific brands of clothing or types of clothing to identify uh, these gang members because it's so close to youth culture that we don't want to start calling kids gang members because they're wearing baggy clothes. We don't. That's not something we do. So uh, <coughs> all of these guys are gang members. They're known gang members, they're self-admitted gang members, but you'd never be able to tell it by the clothing. Um, except in Napoleon's case, because his shoes are blue and orange, and that's not exactly common. But, you know, he's not a, he's not a Detroit Tigers fan. Uh, he's a down with the crew gang member. Uh, he's a Valley of Empire room. Uh, he is, actually I can't remember what he is, I 
think he's street law, but I'm not positive. And he do say black gang to disciples. Uh, he can't tell based on their clothing, any way, shape, or form. Customized clothing does make it easy when they put stuff like South Holly and rest in peace for their gang member friends. Or when they come straight out and tell you I'm little fucking savages from the 44 block. <laughs> or I'm street mob. That does make it a little bit easy. We do see a lot of customized clothing. And that's, that's a little bit more obvious uh, in terms of gang color than clothing. You go to any uh, kiosk in the mall and you get hats like this made up with your gang locations and gang names. Free Jonathan, you know, all my homies on the back of my hat. So. Some of the other gangs we'll find uh, for Asian gangs, uh, predominantly our Asian gangs consist of Southeast Asian makeup. So again, you know, uh, Vietnamese, Cambodian, Laotian, uh, predominantly. Um, you'll see a bunch of other uh, ethnicities and races in there as well, but uh, for the most part, those are the predominant ones. Uh, Tiny Rascal Gang is the major Asian street gang that we have throughout King County. Um, there are, they are spread throughout the county. Uh, they are found in SeaTac mostly. We don't have a lot of them uh, up here in the north part of North High Line, although there are a few that hang out in South Park. Uh, Tiny Rascal Gangsters in Seattle and King County, uh, in most of Washington, claim the color gray. Uh, they're a Crip gang and they're blue out of Long Beach, but, uh, or at least they used to be. Uh, but they are uh, uh, everybody killers or anybody killers. And they'll claim AK or EBK and they'll associate with the color gray up here. Uh, because they like to associate with the anybody killer motto, they like to associate with those AK 47s as well. And our guys will associate with the, uh, the initials TRG, the number 7126, because when you, I guess when you squint or when you stone, you look at that 7126 and it looks like a TRG. I don't know. If they'd studied in school, maybe they wouldn't come up with stuff like this. <laughs> I'm going backwards. There we go. Uh, the other ones we have South End Asian Gangsters, uh, depending on the generation, they're also known as Seattle Asian Gangsters, Scandalous Asian Gangsters, or Strictly Asian Gangsters. They're a blood gang out of West Seattle. Uh, we have Oriental Fantasy Boys, blood gang, right here in White Center. Uh, Little Ruthless Boys, uh, blood gang, again, out of White Center. Uh, and these guys were causing major problems for the Sheriff's Office in White Center back in 2002, 2003. Uh, they've been uh, really underground for the last few years. so. We have, they're, they're still out there, but we haven't heard a lot of activity out of them. Uh, we've got a few Pacific Islander gang sets floating around the area. Uh, Sons of Samoa uh, are found throughout the county pretty much. Uh, depending on where you're at, they're either a Crip gang or a Blood gang. Uh, in Hawaii, I guess the Sons of Samoa, so, uh, Sons of Samoa are Bloods. Uh, here they've historically been Crips, but we've contacted a few Sons of Samoa that actually claim blood out here too. So. Uh, they're kind of changing it up on me, and I'm getting a little confused. Uh, Sons of Samoa, uh, Mad Pack, which is primarily Samoan. Uh, they're a blood gang out of West Seattle, uh, High Point area. Uh, Tongan Crip Gangsters, Crip Gang. There's also Tongan Family Crips, uh, which is not as active anymore. And then we have uh, Young Uso Click, or the Yuck Stars. Uh, and they formed right here at Evergreen High School. Uh, they're not Crip or blood. Uh, they're primarily Samoan, but they allow all races in. It doesn't matter to them. Uh, and they were really active in 2009-2010. Uh, we put away a lot of their top guys, and uh, they've kind of spread out and gotten quiet. So we haven't seen much activity out of Yuck Stars for a while either. And we've got Juggalos. You guys heard of Juggalos? <laughs> Juggalos are this generation's uh, Beatlemaniacs, Deadheads, or Kiss Army. They're very fanatical followers of the Insane Clown Posse. It's a music group uh, out of Detroit, and they're really, really bad. <laughs> really bad. Uh, but they, uh, they're they uh, very hardcore followers of these guys. Unfortunately, some of these guys, unlike the, the Beatle Maniacs or the Kiss Army, uh, actually have taken it and turned it into uh, kind of a street gang. Um, individual groups of them have turned it into a street gang. So we don't call Juggalos as a whole a criminal street gang because we don't want to label the non-gang-like juggalos that are not that are just music bands as gang members. So what we have is we have individual groups that give themselves a name, like the Tacktown Clowns or the Hatchet Riders or the Clowns of the Carnival Crew, spelled with three Ks. 
how you're going to avoid, how you think you're going to avoid law enforcement intention by spelling your name with three Ks, I don't know. Uh, but they give themselves a common name. So what we'll do is we'll call that group, the Clowns of the Carnival Crew, a criminal street gang that uses Juggalo identifiers. So that way we're not calling all Juggalos a street gang, only people that are affiliated with the group that commits criminal acts as their primary activity. So we want to make sure, again, that we're not labeling people as gang members that aren't gang members. Some of the common identifiers that Juggalos have uh, that heavy clown makeup, usually in the style of one of the two lead singers, Violent J or Shaggy Tudo. And they will walk around in public wearing this stuff. They will show up to school wearing this stuff. You will see it. Juggalo or ICP and St. Clown Posse brand clothing, you'll see them wearing that all over the place. The Psychopathic Records label, Dark Lotus, uh, all that stuff. Uh, red and black bandanas, uh, the colors for the Hatchet Man logo, which is the symbol that they associate with are red and black, and so they'll associate with red and black bandanas. There are purpose-made bandanas that have the colors red and black in them, or they'll just throw two bandanas, one red, one black, together and carry them both. So you'll see all that kind of stuff. Some typical Juggalos you'll see walking around, Juggalos the presidents, got the face makeup on. The guy's in the middle here, so he needs to take his Juggalo bedazzler away from him. <laughs> like I said, they're in school, they're not paying attention. These guys uh, had their faces painted up. There were actually uh, four more Juggalos that were over here on the right side of that Coke machine that didn't want to be in that picture because they said, well, my face isn't painted. I don't want to be in the picture. <laughs> okay, so well, who does your makeup? And this guy says, I do it all. Okay, cool. Why don't you do their faces up and we'll come back and we'll get pictures of all of you. <laughs> okay, cool. Sounds good. So we leave. We got busy. We didn't get a chance to come back. They actually went to the Burien uh, State Park and caused a disturbance just so we get called. So we'll take <laughs> Some more Juggalos throwing up the WC representing Wicked Clown or Wicked Clown Love, one of the Juggalo sayings. You got Juggalos with tattoos. Uh, obviously, practice their hand signs in the mirror because they're throwing them backwards there. Juggalettes are the girls. Yep, females are the ju females are called juggalettes, right there. Just as active as the males. Juggalette tattoo. She's also a junior King County Sheriff's Office deputy. That <laughs> <laughs> had to hurt, right? It's a good tattoo spot. Oh, wow. Kind of the Juggalo street appearance. But if you were to replace these images that the Juggalos have with a 13 or with a giant CK for Crip Killer or with any other gang insignia, it's exactly the same. Juggalo family, Hatchet Warrior, Big Juggalo, Hatchet Man. Some of these guys take it to uh, their own version of the gang subculture. I don't know about you, but when I look at these guys, <laughs> that is what I see. <laughs> so real quick on recognizing gang activities. Anyone have any questions on the stuff that we've covered right now before it flies out of your head or I forget to ask? There will be time to ask at the end, too. So. so recognizing gang activity. Some of the things you want to look for. We want to look, uh, and I'm going to use uh, Sereno gangs specifically uh, for examples, uh, sorry Skyway guys, I know you've all seen this one before. Uh, I'm going to use this specifically as an example. Uh, with Serenio gang members, uh, you're going to look for the common clothing style. You're going to look for the clothing in particular colors, you're going to look for the signs and symbols. So, Los Angeles or Southside 13. Do you think they manufacture this clothing for anyone other than Serenio gang members? It's a niche market. Somebody's making a lot of money off selling gang paraphernalia. Southland 13. You're going to look for the same stuff. Bandanas, common colors. You look for tattoos. Most common places for Sereno, the first place they usually get their tattoo is those three dots, the media loca, representing my crazy life, uh, tattooed on the web of their left hand. It's one of the first uh, placas that they get, the first tattoos. Sometimes you'll see that by the left eye as well, or you'll see it in a number of other places, but the most common place is the left, right of the left hand nowadays. Uh, and then the, obviously any other in, uh, individual tattoos representing gang affiliation. Uh, a lot of times those tattoos are very public. They're on forearms, they're on hands, uh, they're on faces, uh, they're on places that people can see because they are advertising their outward commitment to a criminal street gang, their lifelong commitment to a criminal street gang by tattooing their body. I have a tattoo. It's an evil globe and anchor. I got it when I got out of boot camp. I was very proud of being a Marine. Still am. But 
they get tattoos for the exact same reasons. They're proud of their affiliation with the criminal street gang. For those parents, look at their bedrooms. Kid in the bedroom has nothing but blue clothing in their closet. They got Sir 13 Casper with their nickname on a t-shirt hanging up on the wall. Or Rest in Peace Sir 13 Casper or something like that. Something to look at. You're going to look at the backpacks. You're going to look at their school books. When uh, gangsters or even taggers get bored, first thing they do is start scribbling things out. I've always said if I wanted to learn a gang member's nickname, uh, put them in our uh, interview room with a Sharpie marker and leave them alone for 10 minutes. My walls will be tagged. I'll get an extra charge out of it too, and then he'll yell at me. <laughs> he gets the cleaning bill. But if that's what you see in their closets, you see any red clothing in there? Serenios aren't going to wear red. Not a stitch of it. It's all blue. So if you see a predominance of a single color, either being worn or they're always wearing it on different days or their closet looks like that, that's what you need to look for, what you need to be aware of. Going back, there we go. Look at how many blue bandanas are hanging out here. One, two, three. Wow. Everything's blue. Blue sheets, blue shoes, blue shirt. Tagging up their doors, tagging up their dressers, their furniture. See this kind of stuff is definitely something you need to be aware of. The type of music that they listen to, something parents should definitely be aware of. Every single one of these guys, Serenio rap artists. Charlie Rocampo, uh, members of Charlie Rocampo were the Serenio rap artists that actually came up here from California and did the Kent Car Show, which is where all of our Serenio gangs showed up in July of 2011 for the Kent Car Show. We had 12 people that were shot. Part of it was because they were up there on the stage saying, throw your signs up. And so Mario Locos and Playboys and a couple other gangs threw their signs up. And what do you think happened after that? Boom, boom, boom. Did I go too far? Not yet. All right, so recognizing gang graffiti. That makes it pretty obvious. There's two different types of graffiti that we're going to see out there. We're going to see gang graffiti and we're going to see tiger graffiti. Graffiti is uh, easily the uh, easiest way to recognize that you have a gang problem. Historically, that was an absolute. You saw gang graffiti in your neighborhood, you knew you had a gang there. Uh, unfortunately, what's happened now is a lot of uh, gang graffiti has gone away from wall banging or where they tag the walls, and it's gone to cyber bang. And we're seeing a lot of what we used to see transmitted on walls between gang members now transmitted via social media or transmitted via text messages or photos going back and forth. And so we're losing some of our intelligence sources from the street. It's good for the neighborhoods because you're not seeing as much of a graffiti problem in terms of gangs. Tag graffiti is out the door. It's exploded a thousand percent. But in terms of gang graffiti, I'm telling you right now, uh, out of the hundreds upon hundreds of uh, places that are tagged in the White Center right now that are active uh, tags up on walls, on streets, on doors, probably less than 10% of it is gang related. It's mostly tagger stuff that's walking around White Center. Uh, I, used to, I used to drive around White Center and Burien uh, and just document graffiti for a whole day. And I'd walk out with uh, 20, 25 cases in a day. And I'm finding two or none when I do that now. So in terms of gang graffiti, obviously I can take tag graffiti all day long. So gang graffiti, the idea between, behind gang graffiti is that it's meant to be seen. It's meant to be understood. It's meant to instill a challenge. It's meant to instill fear in the community. It's meant to be read. And so it's very linear, it's very basic, it's usually stick letters, and it has those symbols uh, or those identifiers that the street gangs associate with so that you know who's doing the work, who's in the area, who's there. So you'll see stuff, you know, just like, can't stop, tiny rascal gang. Pretty obvious message. Or just, Cajones Escondidos X3, CEX3, Focus Para Locos, small but crazy. We're not big, but we're crazy. Just throwing out a simple message out there is all they're doing. Graffiti really tells me as a gang detective what's going on. Uh, if it's good graffiti, it tells me who's active, what gang is active, what individual gang members are active, who their allies are, who their enemies are, uh, what particular gang dynamics might be going on inside the gang. It can tell me all kinds of stuff. So it's definitely something that I want to know about. Uh, when you see graffiti out there and you think it's gang graffiti, please, 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 please email me pictures because I want to see it. And some of you are very good at sending pictures. So I want to see uh, all of it. There's six main types of gang graffiti that's out there. Publicity, 
which is basically what I just showed you in the last two pictures. The idea is just getting it out there that the gang is present, the gang is here. A roll call where the gang is going to show you all of the members or uh, some of the members that are active in that area, uh, usually by nickname. Threatening graffiti, usually taking the form of cross-outs or challenges to rivals. Territorial, they're obviously claiming this territory is theirs. Sympathetic, usually taking the role of rest in peace somebody or some kind of sympathy. Or political. So examples of roll call here. <laughs> On the top, they're nice enough to pose with their roll call picture. So if that's Joker, and that's Serio, and that's Dreamer, and that's Chokey, Clemejo must be the one taking the picture, I guess. <laughs> So in this case, the guys all tagged their names or whatever, and they were all present for it. In this case, there was only one gang member that tagged this. This is a California picture. Uh, this graffiti right here spanned probably this wall and a half, just for what's on this picture, and then probably another uh, wall length with the gang's name and symbol and stuff over here. I couldn't fit it all in one picture. Certainly couldn't fit it all in one slide, but I don't put you being able to read it anyway. So, I know who did this one. It was Shorty that did it. And, uh, this is a California picture, so I don't mind saying his name. Ismael Arana, uh, Shorty, who incidentally his overriding goal was to become a Mexican, member of the Mexican Mafia. And in order to do that, he started smuggling heroin into the California prison systems uh, in his personal safe, which I'll let you figure out where that is. <laughs> so Shorty tagged this up. And I can read through it, uh, talking about the newspaper of the streets, I can read through it, and I know that Negro is his older brother, Alberto Arana, and Sharky is Dennis Derrick, and Drifter is Bersane Suarez, and Scooby. And I go down the line with the guys he hangs out with, all the way down to his girlfriend, La Casper, who gets last billing because she's a girl. But the good thing about this, in terms of intelligence source, is I'm reading through this, and I'm starting to see, hey, I don't know a whisper with Calle San Marco. I don't know a Blue Boy, or a Bago, Chetos or Creeper. I don't know any of these guys. And those are new nicknames to me. They're either new gang members or they're old gang members that have escaped detection. So this prompted my gang unit to go out and start beating the streets and figure out who these guys are that we don't know. So we figured out who a few of them are, including Chetos. Three weeks later, my partners and I got called out in the middle of the night to a homicide scene uh, where a Sereno gang member and another Sereno gang member had walked up to a guy who was sitting in a chair in front of his house and apparently he owed them money from some kind of narcotics fee. And the word that we got from the witness was that Chetos handed a gun to the other Sereno gang member, who then put the gun to the guy's head and pulled the trigger and killed him right there. Never would have known who Chetos was if they hadn't put his name on the wall. And we figured it out. But because we were prompted to do that, we were able to figure out who Chetos was before the homicide occurred, so that after it occurred, all we had to do was show a photo lineup and we had probable cause to arrest Whereas, if we hadn't done this, how hot do you think the streets would have been for Chetos? How many people do you think would be given up his name after he had just committed a homicide and they knew that? Probably not very many. It would have been a lot harder to track that down. This is an intelligence source that you can't miss. You cannot miss. So this is, this is the main reason why I want to see all of those photos. Typical territorial claims. You saw this picture earlier. The X3 with the arrows pointing both ways. You think that arrow means. This is our territory. Everything you see is ours, left and right. In this case, they actually had an arrow, just an arrow, two blocks over, uh, just pointing back towards this graffiti. It actually showed the boundary of their, of their territory, where it ended, right in the middle. East side 44 block Piru. East side Piru. What you're standing in right now, arrow pointing down. This is our territory. Some challenging graffiti. Barrio Gran Prado Locos, that V with an underline represents the Spanish word barrio. It's a ter territorial claim. You're saying, this is my barrio, this is my neighborhood. So it's a territorial claim. In red, that graffiti reads, Barrio Gran Prado Locos, fuck Vatos Locos. So it's challenging the Vatos Locos, a rival criminal street gang, saying, this is my territory. No Vatos Locos allowed. Or a simple cross out. Dale Block put their tag up, and Deuce 8 comes by, crosses it out, and puts their tag up next to it. In the gang culture, a cross out is a sign of disrespect. And in the gang culture, any act of disrespect, whether real or perceived, has to be immediately retaliated against. And it's not, you cross me out, I'm going to go cross you out. No, it's, you cross me out, I'm going to find you, and I'm going to physically cross you out. And that's going to be either through an assault, or through a stabbing, or through a shooting, or homicide. There are a number of cases 
where a simple act of crossing out graffiti by a rival gang member has led to a homicide with nothing in between it. You crossed out my graffiti, I'm going to shoot you. It happened actually in South Park in uh, <coughs> June of last year. It wasn't a homicide, it was just a shooting, but <coughs> nonetheless. You'll see mixtures of both. In this case, Barrio Loco is putting up a tag over on 4th Southwest. Uh, it's a mixture, you've got a roll call, a miniature one, you've got Clever, Sneaks, Droopy, and Chueco putting up their names. And then they got a challenge to the right, fuck snitches, with arrows pointing down, just in case you were confused. Peanuts and flowers are snitches. I, I can understand how that would confuse people. Uh, <laughs> peanuts is a derogatory term for playboys. Uh, PB, peanut butter, peanuts. So, again, they don't have a lot of time on it. They've got a lot of time on their hands, so they make up this stuff. So they're calling out uh, their rival playboy gang members. They're calling them peanuts as a sign of disrespect. And they're calling them snitches. And they're calling flowers, El Monte Flores gang members, and Flores is Spanish for flowers. They're calling flower snitches as well. In that case, it's because uh, they think that El Monte Flores has speaked out the gang detectives. And that's just because they shot one and he actually told my partner and I who shot him. So I guess that's being a snitch. You see graffiti like this, fuck the gang task force. I guess that's when you know you're doing your job right. <laughs> Standard stuff, crossing us out. <laughs> The difference between tagger graffiti, you will not see a gang member tagging bubble letters. <laughs> Multiple colors, it's going to be more complex, it's going to be harder to read. I've taken tagger graffiti reports and I, you know, three or four years later look at the pictures and I still can't read what it says. Sometimes it's going to be really hard to read. It's just going to be something that's more artistic than it is uh, gangster, basically. So stuff like this, uh, very obviously tagger graffiti. Multiple colors, bubble letters. You got kind of a roll call on the right of uh, tag names that are associated with whatever this tag group is, because I can't read it, I don't know what it is. But it's, there's no gang affiliation uh, involved in any of these. Uh, they are just uh, taggers or street artists. Technically, tagger crews, and we do have tagger crews, a lot of them, uh, tagger crews do qualify as a criminal street gang. There are more than three of them. They have common name, sign some more color, usually the name of their tagger crew. And their primary activity is the commission of criminal acts, in their case, malicious mischief, third degree, uh, misdemeanor vandalisms. Uh, so we can actually, under the state law, classify Tiger Cruz as a criminal street gang. The problem is, we just don't have the resources, the time, or the uh, ability to do that to focus on. Them. So we have to focus on the ones that are shooting and not the ones that are doing misdemeanor property crimes. Unfortunate, but that's the way it is. So the Tiger Cruz that we do have active, and they use these initials, uh, Born So Wicked Crew. Also called Bruce Sex Weed or uh, Born So Wicked Kings or Brownside Riders, uh, Wicked Minded Taggers, Stomp Down Killers, All About Cash. <laughs> uh, men Need Knowledge or Markers and Crayons or Mexican Nigger Killers or Naked Niggers Cry. Their words, not mine. Uh, Northwest Vandals, Always Chillin' and Killin' or Another Crazy Crew. Uh, always Token Chronic, The City Wrecking Kings. Big time markers are bombing the most and down for whatever. Um, these you'll see usually when you see tagger crews or tags by a tagger with tagger crews, you'll see uh, the name of the tagger and then the three or four initials of the tagger crew. So uh, Gil uh, takes a lot of pictures of uh, Mosca or uh, Fly, uh, and Mosca will always tag uh, Mosca with A C K next to it. He's tagging his name and then he's tagging his tagger crew's name to get the reputation for not only himself, but for the crew. Some graffiti is just funny. I don't care who you are. <laughs> but anytime you see graffiti on your properties or in the community, we want you to get a picture of it, send it to the sheriff's office so we can get it for our intelligence forces, cover it up. Get it covered up, because the quicker we cover this stuff up, especially if it's gang graffiti, the less likelihood there is a chance for a cross out uh, leading to any kind of violent acts. So. This is an example in an alley in South Park. Uh, came through here, saw this picture. Gangster Sereno Clica had tagged up a uh, placasso uh, on the wall, and then Vatos Locos came in and crossed them out. So I already had a cross out. Uh, owner didn't cover it up right away. Came back four days later. This is what we had now. Uh, Tiny Rascal Gangsters had come in, and they had crossed out GSC, but not Vatos Locos. And it said, fuck Crabs, because they're confused and they think the gangster Sereno is a Crip gang and not a Sereno gang. Crabs is derogatory for Crips. 
And then Gangster String Yuplica came back and crossed out TRG, put 187 next to it, 187, California Penal Code for Homicides, the threat, death threat, uh, basically a, a threat to TRG, and put their own name up here on the left, GSC 13, once again, saying, hey, we did this, we're not afraid of you. And then the guys still didn't want to cover it up, and uh, the next week we had thought those photos came by, uh, tagged it, and then 44 homicide gangsters came in and crossed everyone out and just tagged everything. And you went from this with a little bit of primer and paint to cover it up to a thought awful mess that would take a long time and a lot of work to paint. So if you get stuff covered up as soon as you can, you're less likely to have this. Uh, gang members and taggers want to put their tags up places where it's recognized, where it's going to stay up, especially taggers. They're looking for notoriety, they're looking for respect, and so they want to put stuff up where it's going to last longer. Freeway overpasses, the backs of freeway signs, moving trucks, uh, trains, places where it's going to get big exposure all across the United States or in a certain area with as many cars passing by it as they can to see it. They want to put it somewhere where it's going to last. The sooner you cover it up, the less likely they are to come back. There are studies that show that if you've covered up the graffiti within 24 hours, you have a good 85 to 90 percent chance that it won't come back. If you leave it up for longer, you're increasing the likelihood that the gang member will come back and tag the same spot. Some people are just screwed because they have a big white canvas on the side of their house on a major intersection. There's really not much you can do for that. Somebody's going to tag it. But for the most part, if you get stuff covered up as soon as you can, it's not going to uh, keep coming back and coming back and coming back, at least by the same person. So there are always questions about, uh, always questions about, will I be subject to retaliation from gang members if I paint out graffiti? Uh, my answer to that is no. In general sense, no. There are specific instances out of California, out of places with very heavy gang populations or populations where the tagger crews are gangs in all but name. And they carry guns and they do all the same thing the street gangs do, where individuals have had issues when they've been painting out graffiti. In our area, if you simply go out there and paint it out uh, with the same color paint, and you're not doing something stupid like we've seen people do where they go next to the graffiti and they cross it out and they say, gangs are a bunch of pussies, or uh, I call 911, you weak ass bitches, and those are direct quotes from what people have written on their own walls <laughs> in answer to the gangs. What have you done when you did that? Challenge. Nothing but answer the gang in the language that they understand. You've challenged them. And they are going to act react exactly the way they would as if you were around a gang member. So now our guys in Burien were surprised when bricks started flying through their window and gang members were hanging out in front of their house waiting for them to come outside. As long as you paint it over, that's fine. They know you don't want to have uh, their tags all over your fence, all over your house. So you paint it over, they don't have any problem with that. They may come back and tag it again, they may not, but it's not there. And the cross out won't be there, so you won't have an act of violence that occurred because of the graffiti that's been sitting on your property for three months. So uh, if, you're, if it's something that you're worried about, you're, you're going out to paint it out, there's absolutely nothing that says you can't have a, a neighbor or somebody else come with you or you know, go out in groups in your block watch when you're taking photographs or walking in the neighborhood and, and whatever it is uh, you feel needs to be done. Uh, I take partners with me when I go into a gang neighborhood. There's no reason why you guys shouldn't take partners with you. So uh, that's all I've got. That was just a real quick down and dirty presentation. I feel like I breezed through that really, really fast. So I know there's going to be questions. Uh, is there a main piece of equipment aerosol spray paint? Yeah, it's still it's still aerosol cans, you know, spray paint. Why don't cans. we just help them? Uh, They're not good for the environment. Yeah, well, they make messes everywhere. I'm going to paint my stuff at home. If you had to carry a little bucket of paint and a flashlight in your teeth when you do this, but I swear some of them must be out with ladders. One of the other things they figured out how to do is to empty fire extinguishers and recharge them with paint. Oh, great. Which is how you'll see those giant 45 foot tags on the side of the freeway. Especially when you're driving down uh, into downtown Seattle and you look at the concrete barriers on the right and left of you and the tags are three stories high. It's coming out of a fire extinguisher. So you can, you can outlaw things all you want. Criminals will find a way to get around it. 